Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Glenn Corbett. I'm the program director for the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, perhaps an organization that most of you probably aren't uh, as familiar with as other organizations like the Smithsonian and ICROM. But during the course of this presentation, I'll give you a bit of an introduction as to what uh, KORC and its member centers are all about, as well as a very interesting program that we've been supporting, the Responsive Preservation Initiative, to try to address urgent uh, heritage preservation concerns, uh, particularly within the Middle East uh, and North Africa. So KORC, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, we are the organization based here in DC that really supports and advocates for our independent alliance of basically member centers uh, around the world. And these, you can see the, the sort of logos and, and, uh, and countries where all of our centers are. Uh, but traditionally, uh, these have been supported, these centers have been supported through the US State Department, Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, as well as the Department of Education, to really provide opportunities for American scholars and researchers who need to do research or language study or area studies in these host countries to go abroad on fellow, like longer term fellowship opportunities. Because of that, many of our centers have uh, research facilities, they have libraries, some of them have um, hostel facilities where US scholars and host country scholars can, can stay. Uh, but you see the broad range of, of centers uh, that we have on the ground in these different countries. Now, one of the long-standing missions of KORC, as well as the, of our individual member centers, particularly within the MENA region, has been the support for cultural heritage preservation. This is a long-standing mission. Many of the, the organizations were around well before KORC. Some, like uh, in Jordan and, and in Jerusalem and Turkey, have been around 40, 50, 60 years. Many were established to support originally American archaeological research expeditions within these host countries. Gradually, uh, especially over the past decade or two, the mission of those organizations has really evolved from pure archaeological exploration to host country, supporting host country cultural heritage management uh, programs. So this gives you a sense of some of the programs that our centers are involved in. Uh, in Jordan, we have USAID and as well as Ambassadors Fund programming to support uh, preservation at uh, sites in Petra and throughout the country. Uh, in Jerusalem, uh, they recently received a AFCP award to support the survey and documentation of the Solomon's Pool, sort of Roman era uh, antiquity site cistern uh, located just outside Bethlehem. Uh, our center in Egypt, the American Research Center in Egypt, has longstanding cooperation with USAID to support um, uh, documentation efforts. And also, even within South Asia, our, the American Institute of Indian Studies has a very well-developed uh, uh, center for art and archaeology and does a range of uh, documentation and survey projects related to Indian antiquities. But as the umbrella organization, uh, KORC, one of the things we've done is began partnering with uh, foundations, particularly the J.M. Kaplan Fund, who many of you may be familiar with, and especially its program director, Will Reynolds to try to use the le leverage, the, the ability, the on the ground uh, centers of the ORCs within uh, especially the MENA region to try to respond to and uh, provide rapid assistance, site preservation and, and documentation efforts to sites and collections really in urgent need of care. Uh, so we focus this program not on large scale interventions really providing through the Responsive Preservation Initiative relatively small, modest grants of 10,000 or less really to host country partners and organizations that really could use a small amount of money for a very specific documentation or preservation project. And particularly in coordination with Kaplan, we've tried to make this program very adaptable and flexible to sort of changing situations on the ground within individual countries, as well as within the region as a whole. So you'll see in the introduction to this that we've really, uh, because we, we saw an unmet need regarding uh, heritage preservation, preservation issues within Yemen, we've adapted the program to focus very much in recent years on Yemen. This gives you the RPI program has been around really since about 2017. Uh, it was initiated with sort of a sort of broader mandate to support heritage preservation efforts um, throughout the sort of MENA and Mediterranean regions. 
uh, addressing a whole host of, of sort of uh, threats, both uh, urban encroachment development. Uh, we support a site in Egypt, in the eastern desert of Egypt, uh, that was a uh, uh, Middle Kingdom site that was being uh, damaged by mining exploitation and sort of military activities. Uh, and Cyprus, a good example of Neolithic sites, prehistoric sites. Uh, that were basically in the path of a proposed major highway system and so a survey project to sort of document those sites uh, before they perhaps were destroyed. Uh, other sites to conserve uh, Bronze Age artifacts that had been in, in long-term storage recovered from ancient shipwrecks. Uh, this gives you some examples of other uh, places throughout, especially the MENA region where we've been doing sort of, you know, support for preservation and documentation projects. We also, as part of the RPI program, very much believe that it's essential for the long-term sustainability of the preservation of sites and collections to make sure that local stakeholders are very much involved in the process of documentation and preservation, as well as that local communities are engaged in learning about the resources that are under threat. So in all of our projects, we very much require and partner with our host country uh, organizations to make sure there's direct community outreach, especially youth groups are invited into the sites, invited into the projects uh, to make sure that there's much broader awareness of heritage protection. So about a year and a half, two years ago, we began working uh, with the Kaplan Fund to say, do we maybe need to adjust our strategy a bit to focus on some emerging areas of concern, particularly, I mean, certainly Syria and Libya and Iraq have received a fair amount of tension in recent years. But Yemen, it's changing a little bit, but Yemen uh, was a particular area of concern where there hadn't been as much uh, attention focused on heritage preservation efforts and needs uh, within Yemen. Um, and so we, we began shifting the focus more to supporting uh, preservation efforts within conflict areas and so supported individual projects in Syria, uh, Gaza, and uh, Libya, but also had a very specific call for applications um, where we began uh, soliciting proposals from local organizations and local authorities within Yemen. Um, we reproduced the call, call for applications in both Arabic and English, ended up getting about 30 Arabic language applications from different organizations within Yemen, and um, awarded about, during our first round, I think about five or six of those Yemeni projects. Now, what makes us a little bit unique in being able to um, provide some assistance in Yemen is, believe it or not, uh, KORC, through its member center in Yemen, the American Institute for Yemeni Studies, still has a functioning presence within the country. Uh, we cannot, of course, send American scholars or students there due to the current conflict, but we do have a, a facility in Yemen that's still run by an amazing woman, the resident director, Selwa Damaj who uh, really does a lot of outreach to support Yemeni scholars and academics. Um, and because of the unique presence, <coughs> on the ground presence of AIYS within Yemen, we're also able to support uh, cultural heritage preservation efforts. And of course, the destruction is becoming increasingly known about what's happened in Yemen over the course of the now five year civil war. <coughs> whole monuments and whole museums being destroyed or looted in some cases, and this conflict is of course ongoing and shows no immediate signs of resolving itself, but uh, the destruction of the, the fortress in, in Taiz, the damage to the age-old uh, Marib Dam uh, in, uh, in Marib. This is one uh, case that's become particularly important and powerful to us. This is a regional museum, the, the Mar Museum, sort of in the central highlands of Yemen. Um, was one of the newer muse provincial museums within Yemen, built in the mid-2000s, had a nice array of about 12,000, 15,000 objects. This is also the base of many American projects back in the 90s and 2000s who did work out of Yemen uh, in the University of Chicago projects to study uh, archaeological uh, activities within Yemen. And then 2015, in May 2015, uh, the site was uh, struck not once but twice by uh, aerial bombardment and completely uh, destroyed. <clears throat> so
So with this sort of need, we felt, again in discussion with the Kaplan Fund, that we really need to focus our efforts on Yemen and so funded a variety of not so much site preservation uh, projects or restoration projects. We felt the situation on the ground was still so fluid and unstable that to focus on site preservation or conservation activities, it wasn't really the appropriate time to do that, but instead we focused on specifically documenting museum collections that are still very much under threat due to the fluidity of the political uh, and military situation. So we've been working at museums throughout the country, including the, as you'll see, the Destroy the Dhammar Museum, the Sayun Museum in the Hadramaut region, uh, the Zavar Museum around Ib. Uh, we've also been working at a much smaller museum, Benun, uh, as well as uh, supporting the Zabid Manuscript Center uh, in the Tahama region to recover documents that are very much still uh, at threat. This gives you a sense of sort of the documentation efforts that we've been supporting using sort of standardized forms that have been developed by other groups sort of as, and, and already being used on the ground uh, that were developed through UNESCO and ICROM um, and really supporting the continued documentation of these collections um, before, you know, God forbid something should happen or these museums are attacked or looted or damaged in some way and really supporting the local uh, staff at these museums to, to do this documentation effort. Also working with the storage. You have to remember that now a lot of these museums haven't really been open to the public or functioning for the better part of a, a you know, half decade now. And so making sure um, that there's appropriate storage and, and long-term care for these collections as the war continues. One project that we've spent a particular amount of time and care with is the Damar uh, Museum that of course was, was destroyed. So with the, initially with the Kaplan funds, we've been supporting the gradual recovery of objects from the ruins. There's an amazingly resilient, dedicated team of, of local and, and because of the situation, largely unpaid uh, government staff and officials with the Antiquities Department and the museum who continue this amazing effort of going through the rubble to actually look for objects and artifacts that, that are buried there. You can see some of the, the small figurines, um, as well as in the bottom right. You have to remember these, these museums are often the repositories of the, the paper records, the primary records of the museum, as well as in this case, the local antiquities department that had their offices um, in the in the museum, so these paper records, as damaged as they are, are very important to try to recover, particularly as they sit in the ground season after season and are exposed to the elements. Uh, just this bottom, one of the, the showcase pieces of the, the Mar Museum was this ninth century uh, minbar, one of the earliest pulpits uh, from the Islamic world that's ever been uh, discovered. And this was an example of it before the strike, very nice uh, example of early Islamic craftsmanship and now this is what's being recovered from the ruins, just wooden shards from this piece. And the local team particularly is very concerned that, that this piece, that they recover as much of it as possible so that it can eventually be restored and conserved. Oh yeah, just, just to mention, very fortunately, the Aleph Foundation, we applied to them uh, to try to support the local uh, authorities to basically uh, complete this effort. So over the course of the next year, will be uh, working with, through AIYS in Yemen, as well as the, the, the General Organization for Antiquities and Museums in the Mar, to remove the heavier rubble with sort of heavier machinery to get the, de the destroyed debris off the top of, of the site so that the collection process and the recovery process can be completed. In addition to the projects we're funding through the, the Responsive Preservation Initiative, we're also trying to bring some attention, uh, particularly in the case of Yemen, uh, you know, drawing awareness, particularly within US circles, to what's going on, as well as efforts to preserve that heritage. Just about a year ago, we partnered with the Freer Sackler Gallery, as well as the Antiquities Coalition and the American Foundation for the Study of Man to do a sort of one day open house symposium very much like this, uh, in which we invited uh, the public to come and learn about Yemen, to learn about the threats to Yemen's cultural heritage, uh, we had several panels, a number of speakers. We were also uh, very happy to have uh, the visit by uh, Yemen's Minister of Culture, Mar um, Marwan Damaj. Unfortunately, his visa didn't come in time to attend the event itself, but was able to come the following week 
and we were able to arrange uh, with the Antiquities Coalition a number of very important meetings for him, uh, particularly with Assistant Secretary of State Murray Royce, really drawing attention to the need to preserve and protect the Yemeni uh, heritage. And it was actually these meetings that, that led really to the, the recent, um, the, the designated list of uh, Yemeni artifacts that are prohibited from being trafficked uh, into the United States, these so-called sort of MOU agreements that the U.S. is signing with a number of Middle East uh, countries. We're also, um, through our centers and through our regional connections, trying to establish uh, partnerships that will help us play more, the, the centers, uh, or the overseas centers play more of a role in supporting, um, especially host country authorities, in implementing uh, priority needs related to uh, the implementation of these U.S. bilateral cultural property agreements, the MOU agreements, which on the U.S. side ban the import of certain antiquities from these host countries to try to prevent or stop the illicit trafficking of antiquities in, out of the countries and into the United States. Um, and so through our, uh, through our organization uh, in Egypt, the American Research Center in Egypt, that had a little bit of funding from the, the embassy in Cairo through the State Department, we're now arranging a series of these workshops over the course of the next year to try to help uh, see how our centers, as well as sister organizations, uh, like the American Schools of Oriental Research, as well as partner organizations like the Antiquities Coalition, can support host country authorities in the implementation of these agreements. So believe it or not, we just had this past weekend, it was in Cairo, also with Peter Herdrick, who supplied this, this photo, uh, meeting with many of the overseas research center uh, directors, uh, as well as representatives from the embassy and other folks who um, want to make sure these issues are prioritized. And we're over the course of the next year going to also have workshops on site management uh, and documentation and inventory systems uh, across the region. In terms of uh, where we see the KORC and the Responsive Preservation Initiative going uh, within the next year or two, well, certainly we continue to fund, again, these small-scale small projects, especially within Yemen, uh, but also beginning to reach out to, to other countries where there's uh, urgent needs related to heritage preservation. So we are uh, just funded the uh, Folklife Museum in Sana'a to do, again, documentation and inventory uh, project related to their collections. So this isn't limited to just, let's say, ancient or antiquities. It's also more intangible and sort of traditional uh, heritage life. Uh, also likely to be supporting the Taiz National Museum, which was heavily uh, burned and looted during uh, 2016 uh, under, by Houthi and, and rebel groups, uh, beginning to uh, also support that effort to document uh, those collections. Very happy to say that we've developed a partnership with SCRI, with the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, to do what we think is a very important training program for many of these Yemenis uh, at these provincial museums that we have been supporting in the documentation and gathering of data about their collections to actually bring them together, uh, about 12 or 15 officials and staff from these museums, bring them together this June in Amman where we'll have a two-week workshop and Corey's uh, SCRI team will basically be training them in sort of emergency preparedness and response um, and how to deal with sort of urgent threats related uh, to, to site collections. Um, and so this is direct partnership with Smithsonian as well as the General Organization for Antiquities and Museums in Yemen. Uh, the American Foundation for the Study of Man, uh, and we're very much looking forward to the outcomes of, of this training program. We're also looking to see how we can sort of, we, we think we have a good model of, of the using unique, uh, leveraging the unique uh, presence of many of our centers to try to affect change in some of these places where conflict is very much damaging uh, heritage. So we're probably going to begin working with our center in Tunis to see if we can support preservation efforts within Libya, uh, with our center in Kabul, the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies, to see if we can help support uh, preservation of Af Afghani sites and collections, as well as uh, our center in, uh, in Iraq, the, the Academic Research Institute in Ar Iraq, which is about to open its, its offices now in Baghdad. We hope to work with them uh, to continue to support preservation efforts in Iraq. So with that, 
That gives you a nice overview of some of the activities we'll be doing with the Responsive Preservation Initiative. Please feel free, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I can uh, give you uh, some more information about what we've been doing. Um, and these are many partners who've been supporting us in these efforts. And just as a final note, I'd like to dedicate this to the founding director of KORC. Some of you may have known her, Mary Ellen Lane, who recently passed away. Um, did so much to expand the, the importance and the network of the overseas research centers, but she herself was an Egyptologist by training and I think very much would appreciate the efforts that Keorg is now doing to preserve heritage, especially within the Middle East. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.